I think it's disgusting that Canada is not acting at all and is the least active member in climate change. It's been called the last chance to stop global warming, but are Canada and other countries doing enough? We have sacrificed a lot of our international regard because our response to climate change has been inadequate. Uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way. On News & Review today, the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit. Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. In early December, representatives from 192 countries gathered in the Danish capital of Copenhagen. Their mission? To try to come up with a new global climate treaty to replace the United Nations 1997 Kyoto Protocol. That protocol, aimed at fighting global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, is due to expire in 2012. But even before the Copenhagen summit began, many predicted it would end in failure. The problem is that while most countries now agree that more has to be done to fight global warming, they can't agree on how to do it. Developed countries like the United States that produce most of the world's greenhouse gases say they are being asked to do too much. And they want developing countries like China and India to do more. But the developing countries say that's unfair while they are still growing their economies and have so many poor people. As for Canada, it will be going to the Copenhagen summit with no plan of its own. The country ratified the Kyoto Protocol that required it to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 6 percent below 1990 levels. But in 2006, Stephen Harper's newly elected Conservative government announced that the country would not meet those targets. Instead, it has introduced legislation that would impose mandatory emission standards for industries, but they would not take effect until 2012, and would be based on 2006 emission levels, not 1990 levels as called for in the Kyoto Protocol. So months before the Copenhagen summit began, environmental activists began making their feelings known. I think it's disgusting that Canada is not acting at all and is the least active member in climate change. This is not just some fringe group that's making some ruckus. This is ordinary Canadians that are very, very concerned about their future. Environmentalists accuse the Harper government of being more concerned about the future development of Alberta's oil sands, a major source of greenhouse gases, than they are about global warming. And they say the government should be doing more especially because of what's happening in Canada's Arctic where climate change is causing what many are calling the big melt. And the latest studies suggest we could be looking at ice-free summers within a decade. The CBC's Leslie McKinnon has that story. This is the drill we used. It's not high-tech. It's what this Arctic explorer calls a mother of a drill. 1,500 times it plunged through the ice near the North Pole. The average thickness of the sea ice was 1.8 meters, which is about to here. The London-based Catlin Arctic Survey, an organization that combines Arctic exploration and science, released the results of a 73-day trek across the ice off Canada, which ended last May. Using the giant drill and a portable radar machine, explorers measured a 450-kilometer-long swath of ice. They skied 11 kilometers a day and sometimes even swam in frigid waters. Their conclusion backs up what other polar scientists have found, that within a decade, there could be open water here in summer, strewn with chunks of ice, but navigable. That's because the older, thicker, multi-year ice is retreating, and it's being replaced by thin, first-year ice that can break up in summer. It won't be very long before we have to start thinking of the Arctic as uh, an open sea. The implications of shrinking sea ice are profound. Sea ice reflects the sun, but open water will absorb that heat and a warmed ocean will rise. The Arctic ecosystem will change. If we are going to lose the ice uh, as projected, we will lose the, most of the polar bear. An open seaway in the north could create a host of problems. That means that ice-strengthened cargo ships and icebreaker-led convoys could operate 12 months per year. And we're not ready for that. We simply don't have the, the capacity uh, to regulate, to police that kind of waterway. It's important to keep in mind, though, that this year the entire Arctic ice cover 
recovered a little bit from record low 2007 levels. However, that cover is composed of thinner and younger ice, and it is still the third lowest level of ice on record. Leslie McKinnon, CBC News, Ottawa. The first hint of what might happen at the Copenhagen summit came in July, when leaders of the developed world met at a G8 summit in Italy. They pledged to cut greenhouse gas emissions 80% by the year 2050. But as the CBC's Keith Bogg reports, they couldn't agree on how to achieve that goal. G8 leaders had hoped to get the new emerging economies to embrace specific targets for greenhouse gas emissions. They even agreed to increase their own targets, bear a heavier burden, if countries such as India, China and Mexico would take actions against climate change themselves. That didn't happen. In the fast-growing economies, economies such as China, there is resentment that the long prosperous nations of the G8 would ask them to sacrifice their budding prosperity to the climate change battle. Their price for signing on to the fight is cash. They want tens of billions in financial support from richer nations in exchange for implementing programs that will reduce greenhouse emissions in their own countries. And they just might get it. The U.S. now seems actually willing to put its considerable political force behind efforts to finance climate change programs in other countries. We are looking at providing significant financial assistance to help these countries. Doing a little bit. Canada's government appears effusive in its enthusiasm for the way the White House is moving on climate. Uh, with President Obama in the White House, uh, we feel quite confident that uh, we have an interlocutor that we can deal with. But Canada still gets pressure at home to do more to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. We're one of the world's biggest economies. We can clearly do more. The Prime Minister says Canadians will find the sensible route on the climate challenge will be to closely match what happens in the U.S. I've been saying for a decade it is essential for Canada to have realistic participation from the United States. We have an integrated economy. If we have regulations that are not similar in the United States, we will simply have a loss of business and production to the United States. With world leaders unable to agree and the Copenhagen summit less than two months away, the United Nations decided to get involved. In late September, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon invited world leaders to a climate summit in New York. He told them that failing to reach an agreement in Copenhagen would be morally inexcusable. But as the CBC's Neil McDonald reported, the most powerful message came from young people. Would the distinguished representatives take their seats, please? In a place pathologically resistant to urgent action or even plain language, Today's proceedings were something like a diplomatic enema. Here were a group of young people narrating their video. We are the ones who will inherit your choices, but what will we inherit? Right now, most of you are failing us as global citizens and role models. Here was President Mohammed Nasheed of the Maldives, the archipelago nation anxiously situated just 1.5 meters above the warming Indian Ocean sea level. If things go business as usual, we will not live, we will die. Our country will not exist. Nasheed is used to all the sympathy and the solidarity at meetings like this one, and he's bitter. Once the rhetoric has settled down and the delegates have drifted away, the sympathy fades, the indignation cools, and the world carries on business as usual. But at least Nasheed wasn't patronized later, the way his predecessor was 17 years ago when George Bush Sr. declared earth, that the United States the earth, wouldn't Russian allow the Maldives to drown. The Instead, here was the current U.S. president expressing contrition about the past arrogance of developed nations. And that includes the United States, that after too many years of inaction and denial, there's finally widespread recognition of the urgency of the challenge before us. And here was the UN's chief global warming scientist with some predictions. Possible disappearance of sea ice by the latter part of the 21st century, heat waves and heavy precipitation. Third, increase in tropical cyclone intensity. Harrowing stuff. Even the phlegmatic president of the General Assembly was moved to a public vow. I promise I will make sure that this world body plays its due role in the climate change. 
Next step, the Copenhagen Conference in December and more talk. As today's youth delegates put it, You've been talking since before we were born. Now we need to work together. It's not a choice anymore. Neil McDonald, CBC Time News, Washington. As the date of the Copenhagen summit grew nearer, people all over the world also spoke out, demanding that politicians take climate change seriously and agree to make major cuts to greenhouse gas emissions before it's too late. In the Maldives, an island country in the Indian Ocean, the government held a cabinet meeting at the bottom of a lagoon to remind world leaders that their entire country could be underwater by the end of the century if global warming goes unchecked. There were demonstrations all over the world and protests in Canada too. We're asking for strong leadership in Copenhagen for the United Nations climate change meetings. We're asking for immediate reductions in greenhouse gases and we're asking for a shift to a new green economy. Environmentalists demanded that the Conservative government do more to make the Copenhagen summit a success. We have sacrificed a lot of our international regard because our response to climate change has been inadequate. Uh, lead, follow or get out of the way. But the federal environment minister played down expectations. We need to replace the Kyoto uh, Protocol with a single effective new treaty and that's the issue. Uh, it's a difficult discussion and uh, we're not making the progress that we wish to at Copenhagen. And then in mid-November, hopes for a successful summit were dealt another blow. Leaders of the 21 APEC countries couldn't agree on what to do in Copenhagen, with poorer nations wanting richer ones to take the lead in cutting emissions, and leaders like Prime Minister Harper insisting that rich and poor must share the burden. The environmental reason is in the future as we move forward we're already close to half of global emissions coming from emerging economies. In the future that's going to be two-thirds if we don't control those Whatever we do in the developed world will have no impact on climate change, so it's important to include everyone. Harper said negotiators were deadlocked and a comprehensive agreement would not be possible. I think the view, Terry, if I could be fair, is that we probably need to get our negotiators out of this morass of hundreds of pages and thousands of brackets of text and into looking at the big picture and coming to some agreement on some big picture items. Shortly after that, the Conservative government announced that even if some agreement was worked out, it had no immediate plans to cap pollution in Canada. Environment Minister Jim Prentice said Canada would wait to see what the United States did before coming up with a plan of its own, and that would take about another year, all of which had environmentalists crying foul. The CBC's Amanda Margeson has that story. <laughs> Don't be misled by the happy music. These Canadians say they're angry about the poor prospects for a climate change treaty. You can talk as much as you want, but until somebody starts doing something, you're never going to see change. Canada needs to show to the world that they care about the environment. Instead, Canada's accused of making a lot of noise and not much else. This climate change activist says Canada's vision is short-sighted. He will be in Copenhagen in three weeks, but says he'll be ashamed to show his Canadian colours. Uh, the new government in Japan have said that they would be re ready to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by minus 25 percent, below 99 levels by 2020. Germany minus 40 percent, Norway minus 40 percent. And Canada's plan? I mean, we're 25 percent above those levels. And basically, why is that? Because we haven't done anything. And at this weekend's APEC summit, Stephen Harper was pushing for emission control in developing countries, but not in his own. And I think uh, Copenhagen will be the focus of a, of a storm of public concern, uh, such as we haven't seen on environmental issues in a long, long time. And with three weeks left until world leaders meet, many groups have started planning, hopeful that the federal government will hear what Canadians are saying. Amanda Margeson, CBC News, Montreal. With less than two weeks to go, summit hopes were boosted again when the U.S. said it would arrive at the conference with a plan to cut emissions. But there was also an ominous warning from a group of scientists. They warned that a new study suggests that without urgent action, global temperatures could rise by up to 6 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And that's News in Review. Don't forget to check out our website at newsandreview.cbclearning.ca. I'm Carla Robinson. 
Thanks for watching. I'm desperate. I want a job. It has claimed hundreds of thousands of jobs. Now some see the light at the end of the tunnel. The worst is behind us, but having said that, it is still uh, is quite a challenge to find a new job, a new full-time job in Canada. On News & Review today, is the recession really over? Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. It's been just over a year since some big banks and financial institutions in the United States began to melt down, and the shockwaves plunged the world into the worst economic recession since the Second World War. In Canada, hundreds of thousands of people lost their jobs. Now many believe the recession is over, but is it really? And what will the recovery look like? The first signs of the recovery began last summer when consumer spending and a rise in new home construction led to this forecast from the Governor of the Bank of Canada. We believe the economy will grow this quarter, 1.3% um, on an annualized uh, basis and that rate of growth will pick up uh, at, to the end of the year and into 2010. But it came with a warning that it could be what economists call a jobless recovery. The labor market uh, is, is uh, the slowest to adjust, and so we can expect continued adjustments and, and probable further rises in, uh, in unemployment uh, for a period, even though the economy has started, started to grow. And that's exactly what happened. A month later, Statistics Canada reported that 45,000 jobs had disappeared in July. Thousands of Canadians had given up looking for work, and the unemployment rate for students had almost doubled. The CBC's Havard Gould has more on that story. It is an endless summer of searching for many students. Rodney Deverlis hasn't worked in weeks. Disaster. Disaster indeed. He's not alone. Student unemployment is at a record level. Students are often um, the workers with the least amount of experience and the least uh, amount of seniority. Uh, so either they're not getting hired or if they are getting hired and there's layoffs, um, they're often the first to be laid off of work. It's very slim pickings as far as jobs go. The labor market is so tight for students, many are being driven to create their own jobs. Marion Waffle is one who is succeeding, working for herself, spinning and dyeing wool. She has even found an unusual niche, people wanting their pet's hair mixed in. Who wants pet hair? <laughs> lots of people, surprisingly, lots of people. Their sentimental purchases are a profitable part of her business. The yeah, cash is coming in so and she expects well, more. I haven't got the online shop up yet, but I've been, I've been busy with orders. Not everyone can create their own summer job, however, and there's trouble on the full-time front, too. Economists say the rate at which those jobs disappeared in July is worrisome. The number released today is a reminder that the difficulties on the economic side are not over. Those difficulties are creating extreme competition for the jobs that are available. This Montreal restaurant had 25 openings, 500 people applied. This waitress was one of the lucky ones hired. Can we shelters? <laughs> For students not as lucky, this will be a summer to remember. One that will leave them with debts they will have to carry for years. After graduating, I'll be remembering this summer by paying monthly my debt. Harvard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. As the summer went on, there were more encouraging signs. The economy grew ever so slightly, and in August, 27,000 new jobs were created. But the unemployment rate edged up to 8.7 percent, which, as the CBC's Lynn Robson explains, meant that while some Canadians were finding jobs, many more were still looking. <laughs> Kim Wynn is a happy statistic. She's one of the 27,000 Canadians who got a job last month. I come here and take a chance and I was lucky. New jobs in the private sector and specifically in retail. This is the positive side of the employment picture in Canada. 
On the other hand, Canadians who hunted for a job all summer and never found one. Because of the recession, everybody's firing people, so it was really hard. Thousands of job-seeking students inflated last month's unemployment rate, and many others started looking for work too. So even as job creation improved, unemployment hit an 11-year high. Uh, kind of share your view on the economy as well. Economist uh, Carlos Leteo says today's employment stats show the recession has been especially tough on young Canadians. The worst is behind us, but having said that, it is still uh, is quite a challenge to find a new job, a new full-time job in Canada. Melissa Marks, for example, she found a job she likes, but...